So, right, so random number, we see stories. We see stories. Uh, and um, we find them everywhere. And this is, of course, we see this in sports, economics. Uh, and uh, you know, for this, for this XKCD or DMD, DMD, deep understanding of human behavior. All right. Um, they understand complexity. You've got six characteristics. That's good. Um, so we see stories. I don't think I'll do that one. OK. Actually, let me, get let me see if this just works a little. This is from, I'll, I can do this very quickly. So this is Heider and Simmel. This is a 1940, from a 1944 paper. Uh, and this, maybe you've seen this, but it, it, people were showing this in this old experiment and just asked to say, what's going on, right? Tell, tell us what's going on. And I'll just speed it up. <laughs> but you know, we could do this experiment again. This is, I think, footage, you know, the original footage. So people would put a story on top of this very easily. And you can have your story you, you have in your head, but people generally, <laughs> it goes but wrong at the end. Someone's upset. <laughs> The triangle's upset, and obviously it's a person. You know, obviously that three-sided thing is a person. You know, it's very easy for us to do that. Uh, so there are, you know, so this isn't. There are efforts. There have been efforts to do this. There are taxonomies for folklore that started in the 1800s. Uh, there are various books that appear now and then that say there are 32 kinds of plots. Um, some of them are to help you write your um, screenplay, uh, and so on. You know, the, you know, the serious efforts. But kill the monster, right? So Beowulf rags to riches is the American dream. It can go the other way, of course, if you wake up as an insect. Um, and, you know, journeys and these sorts of things. Romance, right? Uh, these ones are difficult narratives to get hold of. Stories of the many. They are hard to tell. Maybe we have some ensemble casts in, in movies, but they're, it's hard to talk about many, many people interacting. And you know, we end up running our experiments and uh, creating simulations. And we don't have good uh, built-in uh, ways of understanding these things. You know, when, and journalists will do this all the time, quite reasonably. It happens in popular books. My wife's a journalist, they're forced to do this. Something big happens, maybe an earthquake, and then you want to tell a story about it. You follow the path of an individual who's involved. And that gets people hooked. And, you know, because we can be that, we can be that person. We do it for sports. So, you know, ideally, we want to be able to follow one person. Uh, so this is left null space, I think, for narratives. It's just they kind of go past us. So I'll say these strong things, perhaps, right? So that stories you know, can be these little paths. They can be, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, stories that you shouldn't, you shouldn't um, carry out or shouldn't write. So they can be cautionary tales. Uh, so there's some full ecology of stories. I don't know how we would get to this, but there's a, um, you know, they're all fighting against each other in different ways. And you can think about the current uh, world, lots of different narratives. Um, and as I said, I've a million things to talk about, I'll just try to keep it under control. So Wolfgang Meter is a very interesting character. He's at uh, UVM. Uh, he's a very famous folklorist, and he's the world, world's greatest proverbalist. Uh, he, if you look up proverbs, every fourth one was bound by him. So he just writes book after book after book of proverbs used by Abraham Lincoln or whatever you like. Um, I don't know about... So we've talked to him about trying to f capture proverbs in the, in, the, in the wild and how often they're being used and so on. That, that, that could be hard. But Twitter might be a bad place to do that. OK, so you know, we have these sorts of little, these little tiny little algorithms. They're very short stories. Um, of course, there are anti ones, right? So he who has his best lost, look before you leave. You know, they, they fight against each other. Um, that's actually an interesting one, which came back with the GIs. But, um, and I'll use the, uh, the good place uh, spelling, uh, it, it, which is, you know, we can sometimes you know, say levy, right? These are ways of dealing with things that we don't have stories for. Right. Uh, so I'll say this. This is uh, hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings, right? These are the three S essential parts of existence. Um, continued existence, shall we say? Before we rehearse, I have an announcement to make. Our boy Chris is getting married on May 22nd. Jeez, another wedding. Why, just like TV. Testing tells us that people like weddings, births, and episodes where a character dies. Don't play hard. So, so 30 rock gets it. Um, so survival armor, you can boil a lot of things down to, you know, obviously kill the monster, romance, they're all sort of sitting in there. And you can have all sorts of things probably in your mind right now that says it's not true, but, you know, I'm going to kind of make these claims. Uh, and you can have, we, we do have algorithms for, you know, like the boy who cried wolf, these are group survival ones. Um, anyway, so 
there's just some points there. Let me just add three more pieces to this. There are many, many examples of what stories matter. Uh, these are somewhat different. I'll call this story wars. So Nicholas Emmen was uh, held captive by um, ISIS. Uh, this is a number of years ago. And this is an interview from, on the media. And I'm obviously going to read all this. But he, he comes back saying, well, what we need to be able to do is tell better narratives. We need better stories. And of course, that has to be founded on, you know, you actually have a better life in this world, right? The, the American dream has to somehow tie to reality. You know, and, and, that, and that can go away. Uh, something that people thought about forever, I suppose. But um, you know, in France, we don't know how to write TV series properly, right? And, they, and then talking about killing the narrative. How, how is your story going to fight against someone else's story? Because in some of these cases, we've had people leave the West and travel a long, long way based on the story, which is kind of incredible. Uh, so this one is, um, and I have a whole thing about adjacent narratives, which maybe we can talk about later as to why this is possible, but the, um, uh, the so-called Pizzagate um, story. So this is a, a fellow who um, had read about it, He'd just been connected up onto the web and, and done some research and decided to go and investigate. And you know this, what happened, right? So he turns up with a gun uh, to find the basement, which doesn't exist, um, and, and sort of extraordinary um, beliefs about what Hillary Clinton was capable of, except for becoming president. So, uh, yeah, so the intel wasn't 100%. So conspiracy theories, you know, really, as we know, they're, sometimes they're funny and, and strange, but they can really lead to um, extraordinary damage. Okay, uh, this is a, then a completely different thing. Uh, so this is a study of Gary King at Harvard uh, that claim that they have, um, that there's diversionary tactics used on, on say, um, Weibo uh, in China. Um, obviously, many places do this, but this is to just divert the, the conversation. Obviously, a straight-up deletion of posts that goes on. Uh, but there's another approach, which is denial of story, essentially denial of service by um, just flooding the zone with stories, just story after story after story after story. They're all competing. You're supporting all of them. Uh, and then it's hard to sort it out, right? So this is a, you know, how do we, how do we confront this, right? Because maybe there are only a few stories we want, and of course, if we're reporters, there are true stories we want to retell. How do we do that faithfully um, so that it doesn't get corrupted? All right, but this is, a, you know, we're, I think, up against it. It feels like for a long time, the US has been sort of fighting back with Snopes, right? Snopes has been the, the defender. And that's not a really strong defense. OK, so that's just a, a little bit of stories. There's a lot more, and I just want to say a few things that are hopefully, I mean, maybe they're controversial, but they're just a sort of, and we'll come back to stories at the end, but this is just to sort of, so just to kind of give a sense again of their importance, the whole lot. Okay, so Oscar Wilde, I'm going to talk about fame. This is simple story stuff. This is just being talked about, right? Only one thing worse in the world is being talked about, and that's not, not being talked about. So this is uh, a good take. So BTS, BTS knows how to be talked about. And this is a function of bots and all sorts of things. And every fandom has a name. This is the army, BTS army. Um, if you're not familiar with them, it's a seven. Uh, member boy band from uh, uh, South Korea that exploded uh, in the in 2013-14. There's an explanation for it on Vox if you if you if you look at it. So we'll come back to them in a second. So this is just being talked about. This is not. I, I will show you some stuff from Twitter and from books. This is uh, polling. This is done by Monmouth um, University, and this is uh, maybe the first five six months of this year. Uh, it's a democratic candidates, and this is just simply awareness. Right? How much do you, this is a, a fame level, if you like, so this is simply awareness. And then this is uh, favorability. And this is, you know, spin and correlation coefficient of 0.95. Pretty great, right? So Biden's up here and Bernie Sanders. People know who they are. Brian Williamson did not do so well. I mean, they move around in time. Uh, but this is, a, this is a, you know, we have awareness. Uh, campaigns for many things, you know, cancer awareness and so on. We have many awareness, and you know, for good reason. Right? You need to get uh, knowledge out. So that's an interesting one. When we look at presidents, this is from Gallup polls. It's a different thing. This is just a histogram for uh, you know the whole time period that each president was in office. You see, really, an incredible range, right? This is everyone pulled together. Um, you know, they're able to. This is down to twenty percent favorability up to ninety percent. So, you know, high awareness characters, of course, can be all over the place in, in uh, favorability. So we're not quite getting that here. Um, Trump, you know, has historically been really uh, different and is just very, very constant. Yeah. So 
Uh, this is a, then to kind of go on with that and look more in detail, this is just fame. This is simply being talked about. And, and you know, the reason I'm sort of showing this in part is because the levels are so strange, really, so high. Uh, so these are major political characters in the US in the last, um, uh, last three presidential cycles, right? the, the, those who run for president in the end. Uh, and then this is the handle for BTS. And so this is, on each axis, this is uh, the rank on a day, on each day, right, so each one's a day, of this word amongst all words, right? So this is one down to a million. The word God, and this is this panel, is actually, you know, people use God in lots of different ways. God is usually around about 300. It's very little variation. It's kind of a median. So we'll call above this the realm of lexical ultrafame. And this is the lexical abyss. And I'll give you some more handles on that later. But this is just happenstance. God is pretty famous, right? And, um, you know, people know about God. And they, you know, use it in lots of different ways. But this is, it's not even OMGs, it's actual gods. So this is 300. But this is, these are function words, right? They're in the function word space. And if you look at some of these, right? So Hillary rises up here. Obama's pretty common, most, you know, pretty, pretty popular through all of this. Trump has this extraordinary jump here takes off, wins the election, and has remained above God largely since then. <laughs> so we'll come back to that. Um, but BTS, just to kind of help put a roof on this thing, um, is, is extraordinary. I mean, they, they haven't, they've, they actually made it to, so on this day, they were third ranked according to our ridiculous regular expression, which broke it all down. So the, the word A, and then the, and then at BTS underscore two number two. <laughs> this doesn't happen in books. Well, gets the 27th overall in Moby Dick. And that is cetaceous rich, right? That is a very high whale, <laughs> whale specific book. Um, I don't think anything's beat it. Anyway, so and you can see these others, Romney and so on, they, they kind of uh, disappear. Romney occasionally has an op ed where he's disappointed and then um, kind of evaporates. <laughs> this is then. Uh, comparison this is on a linear scale, and this is Trump's first term and Obama's first term, and then Obama's first term again. And you can just see that Trump is just there all the time, and you know, Obama goes up and down. So it's a real change. It's a real change. Then these are just simply histograms and uh, for all of those time series, and we'll just add it a little bit more, right? So these are ranks, this is the idea of ranks down to a millionth here. And so we start with function words like in and r uh, has, a is at the top overall, God is here, roughly, it's about 300. And then transform into uh, country names to give us a sense of these depths. So America is around about a thousand. Kiribati is down here at a million. Uh, and so as you go through, you sort of see that Obama's kind of like UK, right? There's a nice uh, kind of uh, squishy middle here where he's, he's mostly Finland. We got we got all these tweets from Finland. They're excited about this. Um, from from McCain uh, and then Haiti for Romney. But they you can see they don't have a lot of variation. And then whereas Clinton and Trump have these before and after the 2016 election. So they have got down as low as Rwanda and Tanzania. That's where they're bottoming out. Trump used to be Afghanistan. But now he's above countries. He's at where the word say usually is. And these are very basic functional words. At most he got up to 11th for a day, and that's where the word is is, uh, which should be. Uh, Obama got to me, which is 14th, and as I said, <laughs> BTS went to, went to two, but they've just been sort of pushing up and pushing up the whole time. Uh, South Korea and Kate, Kate I mean, they, they account for you know, a non-trivial change in South Korea's um, economy and the global um, music industry. They really, they, they really matter. Um, <coughs> you might not have listened to their music. I haven't. Um, it's become a real complication, though, because every time you just see BTS, you see K-pop stuff everywhere. So this is then a little extra thing to look at uh, uh, relative rates of being talked about. And so we're going to frequencies here. This is the eight weeks leading up. So this is just sort of a market share thing. And you see Obama, for every thousand Obamas, there are close to 800 McCain's. But then, you know, this is all normalized over time. So much less talked about here in the uh, next election. So only 140 here, but up to 120 for uh, Romney. So the relative, Romney was talked about much more relative to Obama than McCain was. And then we get to Trump, and Trump is, you know, really doubling of, um, uh, Hillary. And he'll, you know, there is another problem here of, of, as to how people refer to, and we address that in the paper. This is just at the year scale, and the most dominant politician per year is Trump in 2017, who got up to 1,000. We'll, we'll set that as the standard, I should say, of 1,000. 
you see it sort of dropped off a little bit. Uh, back here, we've got Obama at 900. But you see, mostly they're not being talked about. But this is really enormous. But of course, BTS, we had to change the bar graph to fit them in. <laughs> so you know, you think you're popular, but then there's people. Uh, so we have an enormous number of time series. We've worked hard to do this. And I'll show you that we're trying to share this kind of thing online. Uh, we have over 10 years of Twitter, 10% roughly, um, that we've been collecting. You know, uh, actually streaming, basically. So, so it's a pretty rich data set. And this is, again, Trump, just as we saw. And these are some of the you know, people who are up against them. This is just their handles uh, in terms of being talked about. So you see Howard Schultz had a little bit of being on TV and then went away. Um, so there are a few more that have disappeared. Uh, but it'll be interesting to track this as it goes on. Uh, you know, Gillibrand, for example, dropped out and disappeared. Hickenlooper was never getting very far and gone. OK, but lots of time series. You can imagine anything you want to look at, of course. And I know we've had this sort of thing for, say, Twitter, uh, for Google trends and so on. But this is, for Twitter, it's been hard to find. And Twitter shut, them, shut some of these services down. So we're going to try to not get shut down. These are impeachment-related things. I'm just trying to do these thematically. Um, you, know, you see Pelosi sort of rising up again here. Biden being talked about, Hunter being talked about. Uh, Giuliani is more sporadic. Uh, so how do you, so, what I, so one thing with looking through all this is, you know, is there sort of more turbulence going on? What's, you know, what's happening over time? Are, are these, these are just, of course, this is a hand-picked set of words. Here are Kurds here, right? So this is an uh, enormous jump there back at the start of October. I will say one interesting character in here has been Schiff. Schiff has talked about a lot on Twitter. Because that's a character that you want to get hold of if you can. OK, so these things are going to be almost impossible to explain, but I'm going to try to talk about them properly. On, I will talk about them properly on Monday. It's going to be hard to sort of get through them here. But I just want to give you a sense of this. These are zip rank distributions for a particular day on this side. It could be anything. This could be species in an ecology. It could be uh, companies in a market. And this, and this is then uh, another day on the other side for Twitter. These are two, you know, well, Specific days. This is uh, two days after the election, or the day after the election in 2016. This is uh, the Sunday of Charlottesville. And so, what we're going to do is simply just it's a histogram, so we're going to bin words according to their rank on this day and the rank on this day. We're going to tilt the whole thing because we don't want to have a sense of bias here, right? Days just go like this. Um, it's an instrument. We're going to be able to move this little thing around and tune it around. This is something, this is the kind of object I'm trying to build more of, right? It's a, a dynamical dashboard, if you like, right? So you imagine you've got your cockpit and you can't, um, you know, you know, we, we're sort of at the limit when it comes to flying planes. We have all of these instruments around us. Uh, when, it, when we're looking at really detailed complex systems with that, which are massive scale and a great deal of internal diversity, pretty hard to kind of get all those things together. And we tend to go for you know, simple measures and maybe find a few things and so on, but I feel like we could, we could actually have everything in front of us. So what happens is we just sort of label these from the side and words that appear further out this way, so this is a word that's really common here, relatively not so common in Charlottesville. Um, it's easy to subset things. Uh, so these are all Trump ones, right? So Trump is winning Hillary election. I apologize if you can't uh, see this. But then you can impose some sort of importance uh, measure, and here we've got this thing I'll call rank turbulence divergence. But basically, it's going to say everything on this line is as important as everything else. And then, uh, so you may have used Jensen Sherman divergence or any number of divergences, right? So there are a lot of methods for this, but it seems they're not really organized. Uh, so this is Charlottesville, is here, but then there are some other things like BTS has to be there. There's um, Heather Hare, uh, of course, um, Nazi appears, and then these pieces here. But this, straight away kind of starts to tell, it doesn't tell you a story necessarily, but it gives you a, a sense in a powerful way. Uh, there are a couple others. This is um, what I basically look at every day. I um, kind of put this together and, and see what's going on. This is two days ago compared to a year before. And you see things like Popeyes is here because of the sandwich. Um, you know, we're getting sort of Super M is another uh, Korean thing. But impeachment is here as a BTS member. Someone probably said, um, OK, boomer. Um, <laughs> whistleblower, you know, you go in and find what's going on. All right. So it's a melange of uh, things that interest humans. OK, so this, you can do things like match. So these are just tweets containing Trump, right? Uh, and so what's in them? This is, uh, again, that kind of, this is, this is 
a couple of days before when I should be before. It's the 11th of August. It's a Friday compared to a week before. And so what you see is North Korea, Kim Jong-un, all this stuff, right? This is when Trump was first kind of tweeting and saying things about North Korea. Or one of the day, one of the times he was talking about. Now this is two days later. Let me just show you. This is two days later, and uh, it's Charlottesville, right? So there's a, just an enormous change in, in the texture of what's being talked about. Um, some in, somehow in, in there, there's shithole, which is the language, but this is one of he referred to countries, so that's that's in there as well. So it is a peculiar thing. So let me just show you one more piece here: is that this is without retweets. Right, so this is a, a useful thing. That when we put this online, we'll have counts and so on for fresh material, and then the counts that are in the, the retweeted material. Um, so the turbulence part that I was talking about. Let's see if I can explain some of this. This is comparing. Uh, so this is going across in time. Just look at this one. This is to the previous day. How much turbulence is there in between these zip distributions that we create for each day? Right. So the zip distribution, if you plot them, they look the same. They look the same, but of course the words have moved around a lot, and that's what we're trying to capture. So that's gone up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, not too much. And what, as you go down each column, this is the, uh, the percentage of words that are turning over in the top 1,000, and this is going out the top 10,000, the top 100,000. Right? So it's a simple flux, how much you're crossing <laughs> this boundary. And you see as you go up through this, is seven days. Um, this is a quarter, this is one year. There's more flux, right? There's more flux going on. And as you go across, um, here across those, those boundaries, it makes, makes sense that there's more flux as well. Now, you can do something where you say, all right, this is how much crossed this boundary. And this, this year, if I go back in time, how many days did it take to, to do that amount of turnover? Right? So it's a simple idea. And then this is using one of those measures. I've got hard numbers on this, but you know, we have to refine it. So this is a, a span of one day in 2018. Felt like you know, one day or so back in these, day, these years. Uh, more like a month though in 2013, which seems slower. But two days is more like three days in 2017. It's more like a month back here. Uh, so a week felt like 16 days in 2017. Three months, three months, eight months. And then four weeks starts to feel like a year back in 2014. That's how much turnover there is. It could all be BTS. It's true. <laughs> But it's a, you know, there's a lot going on. So we're just trying to capture what I would call story turbulence, right? Story turbulence. And that is part of how do you keep whole, everything in your head that's going on in the world, right? It's hard. It's very hard when, you know, if you can somehow delete the K-pop part, there's just a lot of turnover in stories. And, and um, yeah, anecdotally, people talk about this. They say things like, I know, one tweet was, I'm going to write a book about the, the last 10 years of my life. It's called 2018. You know, that sort of, this is a nice trick about all right, this is just something completely different where we're trying to, but we're trying to you know, look at these what I would call socio-technical time series. They have sort of some different flavors to them. This is what we've called the Shufflet transform. So instead of wavelets and so on, right, it's modeled after all of those. We have these little um, uh, characteristic functions, which are little shocks. And you can put them together to make a little cusplet. And then we try to fit these to time series and see what we get out of them. So that's some work that's going through review now, and we've got a very interesting student who's been leading all that. So that's, that's all I'm going to say, but it's too much to put in here. So th all of this sort of preceding stuff, we're trying to feed it out so that people can uh, play around with it. So we'll call it Story Wrangler. Uh, these are just different time series. There's, we'll have emojis in there. The regular expression for this thing is like two pages of normal font, most of which is weird emoji dash weird other emoji, like you know, lamp to um, table. Very strange. Unicode is strict. But uh, the student who's been doing the emoji stuff is alive, but he, he does not like emojis anymore. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we can get him some t-shirts. 10 years of Twitter, 180 languages. Uh, discovered this problem with Twitter. We, we have all this historic data, and this may happen for other stream data that you've collected over time. They've been messing around with the metadata the whole time, of course. And one of the things they've done is put language detection pieces in, turn them off, put them back in, and that's caused some some kind of nasty aspects, especially when you look at time series. That's got mixed in with English and so on. So we've gone back uh, retrospectively and used actually a Facebook um, language detection thing that works pretty well. It'll have 180 languages. We'll have this kind of tweets versus fresh tweets, because that's important. So you can imagine turning the fire up or, or down in terms of how things are spreading, <coughs> kind of after the fact. Um, and so it will be, there'll be n-grams at the level of days. 
Uh, again, it could cost 180 language, but it'll be the same way you can look at time series. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about happiness because that's gonna lead into this sort of last section uh, where I talk about uh, emotional arcs in books and some stuff we found out about um, language in terms of uh, emotion. So this is a little motivation for, this is, I've had this in, in my head from a long time ago. Uh, this is an interview with Greenspan. So we're going back in time. Some of you may not have been born, but he's talking about why well, I build these mathematical models, they don't work. Um, if he could find out about uh, you know, fear and so on, and, and then Schiller, I'm not sure if Schiller saw the same program, but of course there is narrative economics. He doesn't need it. It's a little bold, right? It can forecast the economy the best way he knows. Uh, Troubles can't figure it out. You know, it's been doing it for 50 years. No, no one's, you know, we're not improving, um, which is pretty strong. And then he sort of ends in this dismal way we can't improve ourselves. This was uh, on the John Stewart show, who had this <laughs> erudite response. Um, and, and maybe you can still find it. But it was a very interesting interview at the time. But, you know, sort of somewhat motivational for me. Uh, Okay, so instruments. Well, how do we measure these things, right? So how do you measure emotion? Of course, sentiment um, analysis is a big thing now, but I want to go through and show you a kind of a, a principled way to do it, where I, and, and I'll show you how we improved the way we did it and improved in the way that you might have a telescope improved and it's interrogable and understandable. This is just a sort of throw up here. I mean, it's fun to look back on basic instruments that we take for granted, right? So, you know, time. I mean, it doesn't, it's a, the English are trying to figure out how to, you know, take over the world as usual and so one of the problems was their ships kept running into trouble because they could they didn't know what long what the longitude was and so one way to solve that was to have clocks that actually really worked and, and that's when we really get things taken up but it's amazing that our glass is only 1300 uh yeah we've got um uh, lord calvin who said you know to measure to measure is to know he had some good quotes along those lines um he also said x-rays would be uh proved to be a, a hoax so yeah, you cherry pick the comment. This is uh, this is an interesting piece, but it's basically about um, uh, measuring temperature, which people really didn't think apparently that you could do. That's a pretty weird thing to measure, and to, to know that it's going to be a linear scale and it's going to be okay, and you can measure it and I can measure it, and that's you know, like I feel clammy, but it doesn't. You know that's not the, the issue. Um, and then this kind of claim that you know, the measuring temperature well or properly, really precisely, um, you know, presage the the thermodynamics and, and all the, the theoretical work. And so it may seem entirely obvious to you, I suppose, but uh, it's, it's interesting to look back at when we became good at measuring the thing. Uh, you know, it's a fundamental piece. So we came up with this idea eventually, the panometer is this. Uh, we've made this thing, hedonometer, lexical calorimeter, we have these, these ideas. And we're trying to build this one, which will be insomniometer. So I'll talk about these things briefly. This will be about measuring sleep, you know, across uh, a population. We try to do things that are population level. We don't want to you know, do things that are tracking individuals and all that sort of stuff. We're trying to steer away from that. We're trying to do public good stuff. We realize it can be used in uh, bad ways. A little bit more motivation for uh, happiness, just very quickly, uh, more usually, but Socrates, Eudaimonia, this is flourishing for some of the Greeks that meant alcohol and food. So different interpretations. Um, Bentham, of course, who still exists, stuffed, and it's not a good idea, but um, the English are. Yeah. Uh, and then Jefferson, right, pursuit of happiness, which uh, was kind of apparently uh, added. Um, property was property, and life, liberty, and property was huge up. Uh, anyway, so they kind of argued those things out. So, and that's kind of stuck in people's head. It's a good story. It took off, right? So this is a, you know, you're now pretty old piece, 1957, but... Uh, uh, this is uh, so the measure of meaning. How do we measure meaning? And, and so this is an introduction of this idea of semantic differential. So you give people things to evaluate, and you say, how, you know, where do you think this is on rough to smooth? You can do all sorts of semantic differentials that have two extremes. And the claim, well, the, the, this work using something like, you know, I don't know if they use PCA, but in fact, you know, it was a factor analysis thing of some sort, uh, claimed that there are at least three dominant um, semantic differentials that uh, covered a lot of meaning, you know, a good amount of meaning space. And so there's what was, what's called valence in psychology or evaluation. We'll simply call it happiness because it's framed in that way. Potency, how strong an activity, right? Is it, so you're excited at one level and, um, and, and feeling weak at the other. So you can see some of these things overlap, but they are really kind of different. There are some other dimensions that have kind of come up, rare, real, um, uh, yeah, sorry, I should say regular to rare, real to imaginary, 
complex to simple that people that, that may be um, distinct from these, and I think this could be redone and maybe even on Thursday. Okay, we're going to do a very simple thing. We're going to get people to score words. Uh, and there's an original study, the so-called A new study, that uh, effective norms for English words, which took a thousand words and asked people how they felt about it. <coughs> 50 people, of course, they asked college students, Florida. So um, what, I, what I will say going forward is that we, we and many other people tested many other kinds of sets of words, and it's, it's quite stable. And I'll show you how that comes up. But this is the simplest thing you could do, right? So we have the abundance of a word, um, and then this average happiness score, um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, and then, and that's that's the straight up average, right? So it's it's simple, it's linear, very simple. You know, we're simple-minded people. Uh, it's a temperature-like measure, right? So we're not going to evaluate uh, sentences or anything like that. These are too small, um, and words with no scores, right? They just go straight past you. So this is a lens of sorts, right? So this is this is the lens here. It's going to go straight past you if you don't have a score for it. And it's a social measure of sentiment, right? We've asked people to evaluate these words um, without context. So it's how they feel when they experience that word. Of course, someone has written it or expressed it. So it is a, it is a kind of a social measure. And then we'll get to this piece later, which is that it's improvable and, and tunable. Okay, so I think I'm missing one slide. But this is, um, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, so some texts are comp not, right. So this is a, uh, Lower entropy, high energy piece. Uh, you can run into trouble. It's a good example of not running into trouble. Okay. This is one of the first things we did. We're going to measure um, so-called valence here. Right? We're calling it valence. We're trying to be good people. This is sun lyrics over time. A little bit funny because it's not the popularity necessarily, but people put in lyrics they like, so it's got a little bit of popularity. Uh, we have a whole work on Google Books, which I've had to put in the extra part here, which says basically you shouldn't use Google Books, and I can talk to you if you're interested in that. And, and we have a way of fixing it to turn it into the authorial voice. But you see this decline over time. All right, so this is a basic thing. So why is that happening? Um, well, if you go to the, um, the, the genres involved, then they actually are pretty stable, right? So gospel and soul is up here. Uh, you know, rock is pretty stable through here in terms of scores. Uh, and then this is uh, metal. Yeah. So metal appears and colonizes not just a new musical, but a new uh, emotional uh, niche. There was a, uh, yeah. So, so how do we kind of figure out what's going on here? Um, you can just do a very simple thing, right? So we've got this average of, of these two pieces. Many divergences look like this in some way. Um, some elaboration of it. We've just got this separation. We can just play around with it in very simple ways. Um, and, and then what we'll do is we'll just put a shift in here. So we'll, we'll reference the average happiness of a word relative to the initial text. So it's going to be relative to the initial text. And then two ways this can, can go, right? So you may have more or less abundance. The word may be happier or, or, or sadder on average than the, the original text. So you get these two plus minus pieces. So we'll try to explain that. So this is a sort of a primitive word shift thing, right? We should be able to um, pull out what's going on. And they're all sort of situated here. But separately, these are pieces that are um, driving down the after 1980s to before 1980s, right? So there's more hate and pain and death and dead. These are all negative words. There's less love and baby and home. So these are these two kinds of ways things can, can push it down. There's, there's less lonely, which helps. There's less sad. You know, these are kind of older words and so on, but more life and gut. All right, so these things can tell you often pretty much straight away, like, are you using words in the wrong way, right? If somehow Weatherbots put a ton of words about depression into your data set or something like that. So, you know, they, they tell stories straight away and often the first thing they'll tell you is, you know, do, do things make sense? This is just an ordering, possibly um, made, made uh, appreciate that these are the happy ones at the top and the negative ones are at the bottom, right? So that kind of came out for free um, and it gave us a sense that this was roughly working. There's a Lexicon Valley episode number 62. I spoke with um, a few of you about it before, but uh, it's very enjoyable. It covers our work. Um, it's really quite funny. Okay, so uh, part of this was inspired by Jonathan Harris, who's this kind of uh, fantastic uh, sort of scholar artist person, Seth Canva, who's been in it. Uh, actually, the media lab. Isn't it? So this is this happiness. This is a function of age, and this is back in the day for bloggers. You can see this kind of trend going over here. So uh, for some reason, people were saying they were 13 and 14, so this is, this is middle school. 
Um, it's not great. And if you look at one of these word shifts, you know, we identify the things. So sick is a complicated word, but hate, stupid, sad, depressed, bored, lonely. Gives you a texture of the school. Yeah? Total? <coughs> okay. All right. I'm not gonna do that. So uh, we, we redid all this, and I want to tell you about this. We redid this. We uh, um, got our, uh, uh, we, we took 10,000 words. So let me get through this. We took 10,000 words uh, that we put together from uh, Twitter, Google Books, Music Lyrics, New York Times. So we put in the word the, um, a, we just took the top, you know, the most used words. So now we're trying to create something that fits language. Um, Okay, you've got an award for being a nice, uh, nice database. This is what we have at the top, right? These are happy words, these are sad words, these are bad words. These are the words with high standard deviations, right? So these are important um, because these are words that people don't agree on, right? And you see there's quite a <laughs> tapestry here. Um, so we, 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 we're gonna, I'll show you how we can exclude them from our instrument. This is just a little bit of a basic thing. This is Twitter, this is you know, the daily behavior of people. Um, and this is, uh, these are five words you can't say on TV, uh, and just overlaid, so you can see swearing goes up uh, as a function of time of day as well. So we kind of need to be rebooted by sleep, um, as anyone with children will know. So this is uh, our hedonometer, this is some part of it, it's, it's a, you, know, you can play around with this thing online, I don't have time to do it, but it's an interactive piece. Um, it has these word shifts, you know, they're shareable, they do nice things physically as you move around. This is showing you, this is the death of Robin Williams, right? Lots of negative things being sad, which is pushing it that way. Uh, this is gay marriage. It was a positive day. Uh, this is the shooting in uh, Las Vegas. You know, just completely plummets. That was the most negative day in the whole uh, 12 years we've been looking at. This is, this doesn't necessarily work, but it's online. Uh, the one time that we get unplanned happiness is from spots, it seems. Like, and so this is, I'm not going to play it, but this is screaming and happiness. Uh, you can then do ambient uh, sentiment. This is for, for Obama. Uh, this, uh, we, we were able to see that it uh, predict his, predicted his approval rating um, a quarter in advance. Uh, let me quickly show you this. So these are different time series of happiness for Twitter based on, so here's our underlying word distribution of happiness, right? So nine over here, one, and then five in the middle. This is neutral. So what we do is we open up this window and we discard these words, right? So these are words like the, which everyone agrees is a neutral word. And then some of these words like curse words and so on, right? That, that uh, people have high variance with. So we take those out and that's how uh, we filter them out as well. And what you find is that as you go from about the width of one here to about the width of five, then there's pretty good agreement in the shape, right? It actually goes up, but you, the, the shape is, is, uh, has a lot of agreement. So there's a way of, you can see the gain kind of goes up. So there's a way of dialing this thing kind of like a physical instrument to get a, more, a stronger signal. You're using less words to get it, but it, it gets you more gain. Okay, this is a whole piece here that I'm just gonna quickly say, compares many, many different lexicons for, uh, for uh, happiness or, or emotion and shows that many, many of them match up pretty well. So there's a lot of stability there. We had this, geography of happiness, um, showed that, uh, that, that it correlates well with other measures like Gallup well-being and so on. Of course, it's from Twitter. Napa is at the top for cities. Bahamas at the bottom. We had uh, this ended up being on Ellen, which I'll show you that. I know I'm running out of time. You know, apparently Twitter just did a study to find the happiest city in the country. They determined that the happiest city is Napa, California. Have you been there? It's beautiful. So I sent my reporter Amy there to ask people what makes them so happy. Hi, Ellen. I'm reporting from here. <laughs> so, we, we made Ellen happy, so that's good. Uh, you know, comments like this. I'll just show you that quickly. We had a blog, <coughs> so people agree. Anyway, <laughs> we're, we're messing with the experiments. Not good. Lexicocalorimeter, this is this uh, crazy thing that feeds in uh, tweets. Uh, I'll quickly show you. So, this is the dominant word, food word, uh, at the state level. And if you can't see it, it says pizza in every one, except for uh, ice cream here. Um, and then for activity, because it's an activity watching TV or movie, that's the dominant thing. So then you can see which states are moving apart. So that's, you know, everyone is in the sink there. That's not great. You can see why they're being pushed apart. Uh, so, so for activities, you know, there's and food, so Maine has lobster, which makes sense, right? There's crab down here. 
donuts, but this is chocolate candy, chocolate candy, chocolate candy, right? These are, these are pushing them in the wrong way, if you like. Uh, Vermont has bacon, very, very fond of bacon, so not very fond of Vermont. Um, yeah, we have this kind of caloric thing. And then these are uh, activity levels. There's all sorts of stuff here. There's, so th some activities is eating, 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 eating. Um, there's uh, getting my nails done in New Jersey, <laughs> watching TV or movie. We really didn't do this on purpose, but skiing, skiing, it's kind of an enjoyable device. Um, and then in Michigan, it's just laying down. <laughs> so that's the thing they're doing too much of that's pushing them. You could show that that correlates with obesity rates. We're trying to do insomniometers. Um, let me, I want to tell you this piece. Uh, I'm going to race through. Okay. So this is this Pollyanna hypothesis that we interact in positive ways. Obviously, we do terrible things to each other but um, at times, but most of our interactions are generally OK. And you can talk about all sorts of things here. Um, OK, so this is taking a distribution. This is our distribution for the New York Times. This is evaluation of the New York Times. You can see that. It's, there's, there are more positive words than negative words. This is the rank in terms of usage this way. This is their happiness score. And you can see it kind of fills out these little, these little, call these jellyfish pots, these little uh, uh, tendrils down here are uh, decals, kind of like smoothing down. So you see there are more positive words than negative words, and it's true for rare words and common words. Uh, we did this for 24 corpora around the world, 10 different languages, um, and here they are ordered by median. But you can see the main thing here is that all of them have a po more positive than negative words, which are a priori, not always, but. Okay, so I'm running out of time. We did this for other languages. There's Arabic, this, this is uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Lots of happiness, right? That's, uh, that's laughter in Portuguese. Um, Korean, which has uh, the pies for negative over there, which is a, a crying face in anime. This is translating across languages, showing lots of robustness. Um, I will quickly show you this. Uh, if you, you can see Vonnegut's Shapes of Stories. And so Vonnegut had this idea of, uh, I'll very quickly get this. So this is man, what he called man in a hole, right? Uh, and it's simply, there's a beginning and end, something bad happens and get out of it. You should watch this, this whole thing, it's about four or five minutes. Uh, so of course we're gonna look at Moby Dick. Uh, it's a good thing to break up. Uh, this is what we'd love to be able to do, this sort of thing, but this is still not even plots, but this is character paths. This is XKCD. Again, if you haven't seen these, there's a beautiful rendition. This is The Princess Bride, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, okay, so we did this sort of thing for shapes for, this is Moby Dick uh, at the top. This is uh, Chrome, uh, this is different scales, I should say. This is Moby Dick, this is uh, Chrome and Punishment in Russian, and this is the Count of Monte Cristo in, in France. You know, he wins at the end, right? So um, for the whale's point of view, you turn it upside down. So we, we have this interactive thing online, so we show Frankenstein's badly, you know, right, right? Lots of sad things happen at the end. This is uh, Harry Potter. Um, Dumbledore bites it right there, which is a spoiler. I'm sorry. He comes back. He's never really dead. You know how these things work. We did movies, Pulp Fiction. This is Bring Out the Gimp. Um, so we have a book. We have this paper here, which goes through all. And... Uh, this is, a, this is a fun thing. We actually realized the hedonometer, you can plug the books into a little thing and it traces it out. It's quite funny. Um, it's true. Uh, <laughs> it's a little demo thing. So these are, they'll, they'll look like little Fourier pieces, but they are sort of these six main arcs that came out. Uh, and so this is a, you know, a rag, this is the rags to riches, this is tragedy. Uh, we call these things like, you know, we gave them names like Icarus and Cinderella, Oedipus was another one. This is, this is man on a hole, right? So this is Vonnegut's man on a hole. Uh, this would it ended up in the back of Scientific American. This is Andy Reagan, who's a main student who was going for a run, uh, and that's his Strava thing. That's where he bought the Scientific American. He's very happy. We showed that the middle, the ones that sold more, or if you like this one, good, but downloaded more, was slightly more complex, right? So that was an interesting piece. But you know, this is about contagious story, story spreading. Tiniest glimpse of that. Uh, this is we're very close, and so. This is, uh, so make it very good, great again. It's a, it is uh, Vonnegut's man, um, uh, man in a Hole story, but the problem with Man in a Hole is it doesn't give you a dynamic. It doesn't tell you where things are going. But this is four words that uh, gives you a past, present, and future. It's a very, very powerful template. Of course, it was first used by uh, Reagan and Bush in 1980, and they're advertising. Many others have used it. But you know, I just want to sort of connect you know, these stories, match up. Uh, so science of stories uh, is, you know, so it's obviously many different fields of sort of 
circling around these things and involved, but I, 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 I think we've gone from data scarce to data rich, as we do in all these fields, and we've done that, I think, with stories, um, and, and we can you know, start to build something powerful, but it'll take a long time. This is just to say what happens when you uh, think, right? This is, a, this is an unfortunate aspect. Um, but anyway, this is where we are, and it's okay. It's okay. You, just put, you, you, you can live, live your life like this. All right. Let's take Peter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we've gone through, we've heard a lot today, and I just want to invite everyone to the reception. Maybe we'll just have either one or two earn, uh, burning questions. Otherwise, I recommend that we ask most of the questions outside. Are there any uh, questions right now for Peter? You put the kibosh. Uh, I know, I kind of put the kibosh on the Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, are there any strong differences between how fiction and non-fiction show up in the art? Like we looked at fiction, um, but, but you're right. Yeah, I, that's a good question. Yeah, we kind of went out of a way to get rid of non-fiction, because at least in this study, there's things like uh, encyclopedias and so on. So that was a, a bit of a bit problematic. Well, extremely interesting. And of course, this is just the emotional aspect to it, right? So there's all sorts of other possibilities. I know there's some work that can distinguish them at least, you know, classifying. I don't know how to prove that is, but there's been some efforts in that direction. I mean, it's an open. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks. So let's thank Peter and I. Everyone, come inside.